Hello, I'm Erin Green, staff writer for AEC and BIM at Engineering.com. Welcome to today's webinar, The Advantages of Having CAD Capabilities in Your 3D Structural Design Software. On the line with me is Ben Follett, Structural Engineer at SIA. If you have any questions for him, please ask them in the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A. And with that, Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, like, Aaron said, like Aaron said, my name is Ben Follett. I'm a structural engineer working for SIA. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the advantages of having um, computer-aided drafting CAD capabilities in your 3D structural design software. And the design software I'm going to speak about is uh, uh, SIA Engineer. For some of you, Nemencheck may be a new brand. So I have uh, just a few slides on the company. Um, you may be surprised to know that Nemencheck is one of the world's largest AEC software developer um, outside the U.S., really uh, more specifically in the EMEA region, what we Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, we have uh, offices all over the world, and we develop a large portfolio of software for the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. Um, just a few facts and figures. Um, we've been in business for 50 years. Um, we have over 1.8 million users in 42 countries. 1,700 employees worldwide, and um, like I mentioned before, more than 50 locations in 40 different countries, really focusing mainly on the AEC market. <clears throat> now, in the United States specifically, we're known more for our design-oriented brands. Um, Nemencheck um, owns a company called uh, Graphisoft, which makes a software called Archicad, which has gone on to become one of the world's most popular BIM applications. Um, there's a software called Vectorworks. Um, it's a line of elegant 2 and 3D design software um, that's actually gone on to become one of the best um, architectural programs on the Mac. We recently also purchased uh, Bluebeam. Uh, many of you engineers are familiar with Bluebeam and its um, PD, PDF and, and markup capabilities. But really outside North America, we're more renowned for, more, for our engineering and construction technology. And so this is the group, more specifically, um, the software I want to talk to you today is, is C Engineer. Uh, C stands for Scientific Application. It's actually a three-dimensional finite element analysis tool. And so with that, you know, who are, you know, maybe you haven't heard of C, who are some of our customers? So um, what we see, uh, a lot of our customers are either large consulting engineering firms like KPFFs or Amon Whitney's SOMs uh, of the world, or even um, engineering departments within large industrial companies, URS, um, Mammut, Floor, Alstrom, those type of companies. And what do those companies work on? Um, so really, uh, they run the gambit of, of what types of projects, from office and residential complexes to industrial buildings, energy-related structures like towers and masts, um, infrastructure, buildings, bridges, or excuse me, bridges and tunnels, um, environmental structures, and then also some specialty structures like uh, metal buildings or scaffolding structures. In today's webinar, we're really going to focus specifically on the industrial types of structures and how the software can be used for those. When we talk about the software, we really like to break down um, the benefits of C Engineer into um, what we call the four key benefits. So these four key benefits are fast and efficient modeling, um, advanced analysis and multi-material design, automatic and coordinated documentation, and finally interoperability and then post-processing. And so um, during the presentation, we're going to talk about kind of all four of those um, those different uh, features. And so now uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually switch into um, the software itself. Um, so this is C Engineer. This is our, our recent version of C Engineer 15.2. Um, you can see that um, we have a few main portions to the, gra the interface. We have um, your standard kind of buttons and toolbars across the top. And then we have a um, Windows Explorer like main service tree where we can kind of navigate through all the functionality. And then also what we call a properties palette. And so the properties palette is similar to what you would find in other um, AEC software, maybe more specifically like AutoCAD and, and, and Revit, where any modification or change can be made directly from the properties palette. Now, many times we talk about how we can start a project um, in, in C Engineer, or how we can start a project in any software. One of the main ways that people start projects is by importing data from exter external sources. Um, that's no different than in C Engineer. We have the option to import data via um, image-based files like DWF, DWG, VRML files. Um, we can import data using um, a simple import of an XML file or a Revit or a Tecla file. And then finally, um, we can also utilize the table input 
to input data from Excel or just create the data in a, in a table input fashion, rather than relying maybe on the 3D interface to input the data if you don't, if that's more of what you're used to working in. Now within CIA, you have a full range of different pro profile elements or cross-section types that you can utilize. Um, really depends on the materials that you want to use. So in this case, um, I have steel and concrete materials in this particular industrial structure. Um, and, and, and various levels of um, amounts of data. So we can have, um, you know, we have American and British and European filters, um, and so we can see the different types of cross-sections. Now, one of the really nice features um, of this cross-section library is what we call the general cross-section editor. Um, this is a tool that allows us to create whatever cross-section that we want and actually utilize that cross-section as in the analysis and design and, and overall the stiffness of that particular model. For this example, I've actually created a, a very simple um, kind of general cross-section. And so you can see I've actually taken an HSS shape of attached to WT and actually then mirrored a second WT on the bottom of the HSS. I've also made it of, of two separate materials. So we can have multi-materials. And because of C, C is doing finite elements, we can actually then utilize the geometry, the materials, the stiffness of this overall member to understand the properties. So we can create and, and, and solve for the properties of this particular uh, member so that we can now use it in analysis and design. Now once we have cross sections and, and, the, and, and, the, and the elements that we're going to use established, we can actually physically just start, um, just start to model. And so in this case you can see, um, you know, we can start to model either based on the table input that we had, um, that I had kind of showed before, or we can just um, use one of the best features of CIA Engineer, which is this, fa this fast, and efficient, uh, fast and efficient modeling kind of atmosphere. And so in this case, I'm going to navigate into uh, the structure service, where we have our options for importing, inputting structure. So we have, uh, for 1D and 2D members, a, a few different options. Uh, different options for inputting a 1D member, whether you want to input solely a vertical member, a horizontal member, or uh, use the member command to actually just click the start point and end points and, and kind of draw things as, as, you, as you wish. And so in this case, I'm going to use a few different um, of these options at the same time. So I'm going to start by using the column member. I can pick a cross-section. So let's just go ahead and pick uh, a cross-section here. And we can pick a um, alignment and then assign a height. And then we can actually just using our snapping tools, just start to drop these elements into, um, into the model. So we're just going to go ahead and using our snaps. Now the snaps are very similar to what you would find in AutoCAD. We have a full, settings, uh, full set of, of object snaps, um, midpoints, intersections, so on and so forth. Next we can go ahead and, and draw in a, a member. So we can choose a, a particular member. Uh, maybe we'll choose a, uh, let's choose this 14 by 74, and we can just using our um, using our drawing tools just start to draw in again based on those snapping points. So snapping to uh, different midpoints or endpoints or uh, intersection points of of the particular model, orthogonal points to create this geometry. And so we can go ahead and really quickly and easily create that geometry just by utilizing those particular snap points. So we just kind of quickly and easily create that information. Now, when we're done with a project, when we're done with an input, we can just use the escape key to get back to the to a, a no command kind of function. Now, we can also use the command line. I mean, we could use the command line to do a variety of different things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw one more set of things. We're going to go ahead and put in a um, a set of angles here as maybe our our bracing. So we'll just put in maybe one or two angles here. And then now, just like any architectural or, or drafting software, we have a full list of, um, you know, geometric manipulations, copy, move, multi-copy, mirror, trim, extend. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the copy command, pick my base point, and go ahead and copy then that element, that information down to the next part of the model. So we have the information now that we've created just kind of by modeling kind of whatever we want. Now, one of the ways that we... Um, one of the ways that we can actually, um, you know, we, when you have a large model like this, you really want to be able to kind of see the data and be able to manipulate the data, um, you know, kind of on your own when you need to. And so in that way, we have what we call activities. Activities are a way to organize and filter the model 
um, and can are included in different ways. So one of the ways that we can include an activity is what we call an activity by uh, layer. And so if I choose the layers here, we have different layers created, just like you would create layers in, uh, in AutoCAD. We can look at different layers. So in this case, I've created a layer for this, um, this shoot um, in this particular industrial structure. So I'm going to go ahead and select that that's the particular layer that I want to view at this time. So we can turn everything else off. We could even turn on um, such that we have just kind of the, the information kind of grayed out in the background. So we could still kind of see what's going on, but really can't make any modification to that, el to that, to that information. And so now with this kind of um, highlighted, we can go ahead and start to make changes to this particular thing. So I'm actually going to go ahead and modify the overall, uh, the, the, sh the information to the shoot. So I'm going to go ahead and select one of the nodes, and I actually want to drag this shoot out um, a little bit of distance. So I'm going to go ahead and, and selecting the node, I can go ahead and look at the coordinates of the node in the system here, and actually select a particular property, in this case the X definition of that particular node, and then select what we call the Select Elements by Properties tool. So when I use this selection tool, it's going to select for me automatically all the other nodal elements that have that similar property. Now in doing so, we can go ahead and then bulk change these items from that, you know, from the position of 44 and a half to 45 and a half feet. So now we've kind of stretched that information out. Now again, if we need to continue to model, we're going to use maybe this time, we're going to use in this case plates. So I can start to use a plate to model and draw in and, and, and sketch out my, my uh, geometry. And so just using some snap points, um, and inherent snap points, we can start to build in that geometry. So now I've got that plate in there. Just like we said before, I can go ahead and use a ge geometric manipulation tool, like the mirror in this case, and pick the mirroring plane that we want to use. So in this case, let's see. Let's rotate around here so we can see how we're actually mirroring it. And so now if we just choose the mirror, no, we don't want to remove the original. Now we have that other piece mirrored on that other side. Now, you know, we've made those changes to the shoot. We need to go ahead and obviously review how those changes affect the rest of our model. So I'm going to go ahead and turn back on everything here. Now we can see that, well, you know, this shoot now is kind of impacting, it's kind of intersecting with this particular line of, of beams. Or maybe it's, we don't have enough clearance there so that we could get in and work on that particular part of the shoot. And this is just a process that we as engineers go through all the time. A change is made maybe in an architectural project because, um, you know, because the architect is making changes or the spatial relationships are changing. Or in an industrial project, you know, the, the mechanical systems have to change. Or, you know, the industrial structure that we're supporting, it, like in this case that chute, needed to change because the flow of material through the chute needs to change. So in this case, I'm going to use a similar function in the sense that I'm going to go ahead and select what I know to be one of the nodes along that line. I'm going to grab the coordinate, so I'm going to grab all of those similar elements, and I can go ahead and just um, move them out to, say, uh, 47 feet. So I'm going to go ahead and stretch those out a foot to pull those away from then the, the model itself. And so now we have, that, we have that necessary clearance there. So we've really made some very, um, you know, we've made some very easy, but maybe in some other softwares, more complex manipulations to the overall 3D model based on the fact that we've been able to see kind of exactly what's happening. Now we also can just add, we've added some plates, you know, if we wanted to add a, a floor plate here, you know, we could, we could define uh, a dimension based on, uh, you know, whatever we want, and we can start just easily sketching out the floor plate. One of the things you'll notice um, at, one of the things you'll notice at the, um, at the bottom of the screen, right above the command line, is that we have this, these sketching tools. And so we could either select a polygon, we could sketch, not necessarily using a straight line, but using circular arcs or parabolic shapes or spline shapes to go ahead and easily create, you know, the, a part of the structure that we want. In this case, you know, I just created a, a, little, uh, a little steel plate that uh, maybe serves as our, as our, as our decking in that case. Now, ultimately, when we get to this point, we always, have to, we always have to start to consider, we always have to really start to think, okay, we've got the model created, um, we've, you know, maybe added supports, we've got everything done. Now, how do we go ahead and load the structure? So once again, I'm going to go ahead and actually turn on this shoot. And let's go ahead, we'll, we'll uh, delete this out of here just so we don't see it here. So we'll turn on this shoot, and we want to maybe go ahead and load this shoot. 
So if I close out of the structure service, I'm going to go ahead now into the load service. Now at this point, I've actually created some just standard load cases that we're going to put different physical loading in. Now all the typical loading that you're familiar with in other software is, is available, point loads, line loads, surface loads, thermal loads, both on 1D members and 2D members, moments, displacements, point displacements, so on and so forth. One of the really most unique features of C Engineer is the ability to um, use what we call free surface loads. So free surface loads are actually the ability to create a surface load such that it doesn't have to be defined on one surface, but you can define it completely independent of the surface and then apply to a specific surface and then apply it to all the other surfaces around it. And so in this case, um, I've gone ahead and I've manipulated the working plane such that I'm gonna, I want to create my surface load in this general area of this chute. And I actually want to create a surface load that is uh, linearly varying based on depth. You know, the, the load of uh, maybe the grain or whatever product is in this is going to vary based on how deep it is. So instead of using a surface load on a 2D member, I'm going to use what's called a, surf a free surface load. So here within the free surface load, we can see that I can set a direction, type, uh, a distribution direction. So I'm going to vary in the Y direction. And then I can go ahead and um, create, you know, just the load itself. So I'm going to go ahead and just create the load. And then now you can see our command line is starting to tell us what the next step in this particular um, project is. So I'm going to go ahead and say the next step here is to insert the polygon. So I'm just going to go ahead and use our sketching tools to just sketch out a part of this particular load. So I'm just using those intersections and sketching out that load. So in doing so now I've created we can see here from the side it's probably easier, but I've created now that linearly varying load that is going to get applied to this particular part of the structure. Now, because I sketched it in the same plane as these plates, it's going to be applied to all those plates. Now, I could change different data from this particular uh, load based on the properties here, just like any other element in the properties of it. I could change, you know, what load case it belongs to. I could change the magnitude. We could change that it only maybe would be applied to certain surfaces. But in this way, we can be really flexible in, in how we apply the loading um, to a structure like this. Okay, at this point, um, you know, really we've, we've created load, you know, we've created some modeling, you know, and we know, you know, that fast and efficient modeling is really not only just the model itself, but also the loading that we have to apply to the model. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the analysis options. So SIA really has uh, a wide range of analysis capabilities. So having all the analysis capabilities integrated into a single modeling environment really makes SIA very efficient for your day-to-day -day work. Um, so really what you'll find is you, you won't really hit your head on the ceiling very quickly. So with SIA, you really have a program that will let um, you know, your company you know, take on bigger and more complex projects because you're just not going to have to jump to you know, another software once you get out of maybe a typical building or a typical structure. And so we have a really extensive list of analysis capabilities. There's a couple I want to highlight because I think they're important to um, industrial, kind of the industrial space. Obviously, the first is uh, nonlinear. So uh, a few different use cases, obviously, brace frames with tension-only members, guide masts with cable or steel roping, um, also the direct analysis method, which is prescribed by AISC, um, you know, is very useful for these types of structures. We have a, uh, f actually five different nonlinear analysis calculation methods. Uh, I just kind of highlighted three, the Timonchenko and the newton rapson and the Picard method are kind of uh, more widely known than some of the others. Um, and really, we had just create the input data, and out of that, we're going to get a redistribution of forces, obviously equilibrium in the structure, and then we'll be able to have these checks comply with the AIC code check require requirements because we're now running a nonlinear secondary or second order analysis. The second is dynamics, especially with um, a structure like I was showing. You know, we get a lot of movement based on you know grain or or, or uh, product running through. So we could just do a simple natural frequency cal calculation, maybe a little bit more uh, of a resonance calculation, or even adding a harmonic load. So inputting that harmonic load as a as a frequency and then doing some damping, um, pulling out results like eigen frequencies or mass participation or eigen mode shapes, animating those eigen mode shapes to really understand the structure. We could also do a full seismic uh, dynamic um, eigen-based analysis, if we'd like to, um, and so that's just another option. As well as if you, you know, if we're doing more building-based ap applications, something like the equivalent lateral force procedure. The last one I want to point out is is one called what we call stability. So it, essentially, what we uh, the module allows us to search for buckling modes that would lead to the collapse of a structure. So we're really trying to understand how the structure is truly going to buckle. 
um, a lot of what we end up hap what we end up doing is we use the K factors that are right out of the, the steel code. And in a lot of cases, those are really oversimplifications of, of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so in that case, using the stability analysis allows us to understand under what type of load, under you know, what load coefficients, those critical load coefficients, is the shape going to buckle. And then we can utilize that buckled shape actually as a true buckled shape and a true um, relationship of our K factors in the steel code check. So in that case, we actually can you know, better understand how it's going to buckle rather than maybe making some uh, over conservative assumptions, or we could actually understand how the structure is going to fail under certain loading conditions. So let's talk a little bit more about um, let's talk a little bit more about the mod, or about the analysis itself. I'm going to actually jump into the same model. I've actually just have some re results produced in this particular model. Again, I'm going to go ahead and switch to um, our layer activity to, to just show this um, this shoot. And in showing the shoot, I actually want to talk a little bit about uh, the mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and enable just so you can see the mesh here. Let's, those are some refinements. I'm actually going to turn those refinements off. But here, this is the general mesh of this particular uh, this particular part of the structure. So meshing in C Engineer is automatic. So the user sets up a global mesh size and then utilizes refinements um, like those those that you just saw, nodal refinements, edge refinements, or in that case, surface refinements to change the mesh size. So I can have a different mesh size on every single individual plate if I want to. Or I can let Sia just say, I want to have a one foot global mesh on everything, generate that mesh for me. Now the software is never going to break apart these elements into these smaller mesh items. So this, you know, this part of the this part of the element here, that little that little square there, that's always going to be that little square. It's never going to be broken down into the nine or ten mesh elements that you see there. And so that really allows us some flexibility, not only in modeling but in analysis, that we don't have to delete stuff when changes happen or lose a mesh or whatever. The mesh is just automatically generated either when we run the calculation or we could run the mesh ahead of the calculation to review it and make sure it's okay. We also have some automatic mesh refinement tools. Um, so basically, it's possible to utilize the loading conditions to determine um, what the optimal mesh will be and then to reduce kind of relative error between mesh elements. So when you have a too large a mesh, you get kind of changing in results or reversing of results between mesh elements. We want to kind of get rid of that so that our mesh, our, uh, mesh and our results are more accurate. We could use that automatic mesh refinement. Okay, so let's talk about some results now, different types of results that may be useful here. So I'm going to turn everything back on. And let's lose the mesh, in this case, just the viewing of the mesh. And I'm going to navigate in the Windows Explorer interface here to results. So the first result that I want to look at is contact stresses. So I've actually, for this particular mat slab in this case, defined subs the ability to create the elastic foundation springs, right, to use uh, in the determination of the bearing capacity. So we can moderate, we can, the user can change the subgrade modulus if they want, or SIA can actually calculate based on uh, depth of soil and, and actually a borehole report can calculate um, the flexibility of the soil. So in this case, I've selected contact stresses as the result that we want to look at, and I'm going to go ahead and produce the value for um, uh, the bearing capacity in the in the z direction, which is obviously the most re obvious direction. So in this case, based on how I'm looking at the the mesh results, we can see here we just have a simple, very simple contour plot or a mesh plot of where our peak pounds per square foot are for our for a different mo for a model. So, you know, at the at the edge of this wall here, we've got somewhere around 5,200 pounds per square foot, and and on the other side here, we've got almost uh, you know 100. And so we can see those different um, you know bearing capacities to see if we're maybe meeting the this the the requirements of our bearing capacities. Now we can also do um, you know we have those are some 2D results. We can also look at maybe some some 1D results in this case. So. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and open up a, a saved selection. I've actually saved a group of members as a certain selection. So in that case, I'm going to say, call it, I have one called load takedown. I just selected a, a particular member here. And we're actually just going to pull the results based on this particular member for um, maybe the axial loading. And so the axial loading here, we can see, I'll turn everything off so we can actually see it here. You know, we can see that axial loading as a load takedown. So we're going to go ahead and see that very particular set of data. Now, we can always look at this data graphically. At any time, though, we can also, under the actions here, click preview. That preview is going to automatically pop up what we call the report preview. And that's going to just give us a basic little table of exactly what you've set as the output from the properties here. Now, if you change the output such that, you know, I wanted to add in, 
the shears or the moments, we would get some, we would get a different table. So this table is really active based on the fact, based on what you have um, shown in here. Now there's another, there's a, there's uh, a bunch of other options for analysis results. We certainly don't have time to go through all of them today. Um, different displacements of nodes, deformed structures, even 3D displacements and stresses. So understanding within the fibers of elements, kind of where the stresses lie through the thickness of that. Um, support conditions, you know, whether it's just uh, pin support reactions, resultants of reactions, or we saw contact stresses. All of those are options. Now, um, I did want to switch because we not only just talked about um, analysis, but we want to talk about design as well. So I'm going to utilize the same kind of load takedown element just to talk a little bit about steel design. And so in this case, you know, we, we can select within the steel service, you know, the design for, you know, beams or joists or, or whatever. In this case, we're going to do it, go ahead with the steel frame design. And so within the steel frame design itself, um, we can run uh, a check of ASD. So I'm going to go ahead and just run this particular check. And we're going to get a globe, you know, we're going to get a, um, a plot here. So let's change some of the rendering here so we can see this a little bit better. We're just going to get a unity check plot kind of drawn along the length of the member so that we understand kind of how this unity check is working. Now, in this case, we've got two unity checks. I'm showing the maximum unity check for each member. So there's one column here and there's one column on top here. Now, we could always show just a very simple brief output, you know, just a simple table, brief output, what's the member, what's the cross-section material, what's the unity check. We could also, though, if we desire show a more detailed check. So if I go ahead and run that detailed check, we're now going to get the check of steel run and with all the information filled in. So now we have the AISC 36010 check that's going on. Here's our classifications, our different you know, torsional checks, all the loads and based on the certain formula. And we get down to ultimately what we're going to have, which is an H3-7 uh, check. So here's this torsional check. And we're going to, that's, you know, that's that, that maximum value that we're using here. So we can print out that full amount of data. Now, we always get the question, you know, when you're doing the, the checks like this, when you're doing the information like this, um, you know, how do you, what, you know, how do you, how do you do buckling? You know, what do you do as far as buckling is concerned? So if I go ahead and select a member, we actually have a few different ways to buckle, to, to define buckling. We could even define them in groups. Um, so you can see I have buckling in relative lengths where I've defined, you know, in a group every four, you know, this particular four span member is, braced for strong and weak access in this, in this fashion. Now we can also view this in a graphical way. So if I go ahead and click on graphical input of system length, for whatever we have selected, we can actually see graphically kind of how and what are, uh, you know, where the buckling conditions are. So in this case, for the strong axis buckling, we can see those are buckling conditions. For the weak axis buckling, same thing. We could enable second or third and fourth uh, levels of buckling relationship, torsional, lateral torsional buckling. And we can also just simply, for individual members, actually select the tags, turn on and off the tags so that we can change you know, the buckling lengths for that particular member. And so all this can be done on the member level, on the group level, or globally on the global level. And so you have some different options to really play with the buckling because we all know that really the buckling really controls how the check is being done with those unbraced lengths. Now as far as concrete design is concerned, um, I actually have uh, a little kind of a little video that I wanted to show. Um, let's see if I can make my video. There we go. A little video that I just wanted to show. This is the wall. Um, and actually, in this particular in, in, uh, uh, model, we're going to go ahead into the member design in the concrete service. Now, within the concrete service, we can choose um, the required reinforcement that we'd want calculated for this particular wall. And we can actually choose our values as well. So our values are different areas of reinforcement that's required in either the top face or the bottom face in various directions. So either, you know, positive top face, negative bottom face, the, the local one or two direction, which is the local X and Y directions. And so we can select an output, run the design to get this contour plot of data for um, the amount of reinforcement that were required in this case. Again, looking at a preview, we can go ahead and just see, okay, here's the area reinforcement in each level, and in addition to the area steel reinf or shear reinforcement, excuse me, that we need in this particular slab. Now, if we wanted to change and look at a different value for the amount of reinforcement, we can go ahead and just choose a different value and, and see a different level of reinforcement. Now, it's also possible to look at or add our own what we call user reinforcement. So if I go ahead and run the user reinforcement here, we can see that we actually have, you know, um, 0.62 area uh, inches squared per foot uh, of area of steel in this. And so, 
the, you know, the question is in this case, what does that look like? And so we can actually enable, I've actually physically drawn in using what we call the reinforcement 2D service. So we, we can actually physically add in uh, a mesh, you know, a mesh of reinforcement or, or, or bars at certain levels with certain spacing, certain cover. So I'm going to go ahead and look at these mesh, this region to visualize here the reinforcement now that we have at each level. So if I select a, a, a setting of reinforcement here, we could see that we have in both directions, we have, um, you know, uh, 60 KSI bars. On this case, it's in, in the, on the upper level. Fives at, at six inches on center in both directions. That's that 0.62 that's being used to validate the reinforcement or check the reinforcement that we have in a particular wall. And so that's obviously, like I mentioned before, is added using that 2D reinforcement. And so in that case, we could either we can either design the you know, allow C to design the reinforcement for us, tell us how much reinforcement we're going to need, or we could actually do a verification or a check of that reinforcement. And this type of reinforcement that, you know, I just showed a wall there, um, but this type of reinforcement design can be done for any type of two-dimensional element, whether it's a, a plate or a wall or even a more complex, maybe shell-based element. Um, it doesn't matter in that case. All those different types of elements can be, um, you know, the reinforcement can be designed for even those complex geometries that we would see. Now the last part of the design, and it also kind of features into what we call post-processing, the last part of the design that I wanted to mention is um, what we call uh, SIA design forms. So SIA design forms is actually an external um, application that allows both us, the developer, and a user like yourself to add additional design checks directly into SIA by the way of what we call this open checks technology. So it's basically a very simple MathCAD-like scripting environment that allows you to extend this functionality. So once you create a form, you know, we call them design forms, once you create these design forms, they can be linked directly into C Engineer through what we call the integrated design forms check service. And so that service can house all of your, you know, self-created forms such that, you know, I'm sure that many, many of our customers have external applications that they're using to do different parts of the design, whether it's foundations or um, you know, different specialized checks because they they do specialized structures. You know, really the downfall of those applications is not you know what the, the design that they do, but really that's just it's just disconnected from the overall model that you're building. You're not really getting to understand really how the structure um, and the, the loads are maybe being taken into a certain specialized design because it's just not connected to your model. And so with design forms, we allow you to do that. And so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and open up the integrated design forms, and I actually have one tied with this particular one. You can see it down here. I've tied it to this particular column here. I have a column base plate check. And so in this case, if I want to, you know, define the parameters of this column base plate check, I can go ahead and click on the parameters, and I can go ahead and look at um, look at the data that I'm defining. So I'm going to go ahead and just expand this here. So I have, you know, I'm I'm pulling in information from the model, but I can set different sets of information. You know, do I want to use bolt shear, friction, or embedment? You know, what's the size of my base plate in this case? You know, how are my welds, you know, I can modify and check my anchor bolts, you know, set my reduction factors, you know, do I, am I sitting on a pier, am I sitting on a footing, you know, what's my thickness, so on and so forth. And then some basic design options, are we going to crack the concrete, are we using grout pads, what's our design method. Now setting these, this information then allows me to go ahead and then physically run the checks, so to validate that, that particular base plate is actually going to work. So if I go ahead now into the column base plate, again, now this data is, I created this in design forms, it's tied to SIA. If I go ahead and just run in now, if I just run in then our particular check and click refresh here, we're going to go ahead and get a, you know, just a, just a little, you know, it's just a little kind of unity check here. It's telling us the maximum unity check for every check that this particular element is running is this 0.6. Now, if I go ahead and look at the different levels of output, I'm going to go ahead and look at, say, the table output in this case. And I look at the preview, we can see, you know, actually the check that's being done. And so the check in this case that's being done is not one check, not one, you know, specific uh, portion of the check, but it's actually a much larger portion of the check. So all of these limit states are being validated in this particular design check. And so we can see, you know, okay, here's the required value, here's the status that it's okay, you know, you know which check is, is controlling. Now we can also look at something much more detailed in this. So if we go ahead and choose the detailed check, we're not only going to get the results of 
just the check itself. We're also going to get then every single portion of that limit, those limit states, you know, filled in. So we're seeing, okay, how's the plate eccentricity being calculated? How's the, bait, the bearing plate thickness and the thickness of that plate being calculated? You know, how are we doing the welds and, and the concrete breakout and the anchor bolt strengths and stuff like that? So all, we're rendering now all the, all the data of this calculation. And so this is certainly one that we created on our own, but the same holds true for anything that, that you would create in design forms it's, it, itself. It would be, you know, you would have the option to create output that, that is by default just as, as, as detailed as this or create output that's, that's much less detailed than this. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility to, um, to create whatever you want and link it into the software. Now the final part of this whole process, the final part of kind of our engineering process, you know, we've done the design, we've added, we've created the model, we've added the loads, we've run the analysis, we've done the design. Now it's really time to document. We have to, we have to figure out a way to really document the model. And so in SIA, we actually have what we call the engineering report. The engineering report is a standalone um, application that actually works dynamically with the model itself. And so from SIA, from SIA I can actually create, um, you know, views of the model. So if I right click on the screen, I can save screenshots or live pictures directly to the engineering report. I could save result documents or tables to the engineering report of whatever result I'm viewing and then utilize those in the engineering report. So in this case here, let's go ahead and just expand this engineering report. This is the engineering report for this particular model. So in this case here, you can see I've brought in this document picture here. Now this document picture is, uh, the, you know, briefly the difference between something say like a screenshot, is, it's just a screenshot, it's a, it's a, it's a static version of the model. Now, the, we also have what we call live picture. Live picture could be of results or actually a physical live picture of the model in the sense that if you make a change either to the result type or, you know, the, the loads added to the model or you make a change to the model itself, that picture now is a dynamic image of the model. And so when you refresh the, the analysis information of the model, then at the same time, the report itself is going to refresh and that picture is also going to refresh. So it's really a dynamic view of the model. And so everything in this particular output, everything in this um, engineering report is dynamic. And so if we scroll down through here, we can see the table. This is kind of the, what we call the navigator. It's really the kind of the contents of whatever we're doing here. We can see the new items. These are all the items from SIA that you can add into, it, into the project. So here we've got a table of contents just some different cross-section lists, materials, load cases, combinations. Here a picture, this is a static image of the contact stresses. So we can see, you know, a table view of the contact stresses in addition to maybe a picture view of the contact stresses. You know, we can see internal forces on, on different settings of the members. You know, we can look at displacements. And so here we can see like a, a 3D displacement of how the, how the, the that uh, hopper itself is displacing. And then we can also see the, the checking of the reinforcement. So here I've just put in a result for the check. Any of these pieces, you know, can, will be updated. Based on the, if the now additionally, uh, in many cases, you have a very standard, um, a very standard way that you like to create reports, or maybe a very standard way that a certain customer likes to see a report. And so in that case, we also have the ability to create what we call report templates. And so if I like the way this is set up and this is kind of how I want to produce a report for a certain client, I can save it as a report template. And then from now on, instead of having to add all of this information, all these pictures, all this data, these tables, set them up a certain way, modify them and manip manipulate them the way I want to see them, I can set them in the, the template such that now I just come into the model the first time, I execute the template, and then all that information is brought in for me on it on my own, on its own, and so it can really allows you to create these reports really efficiently, you know, for every additional project after that. Really creating that template for what you're doing. Now the last part of this is we've created the documentation. You know, we've got great documentation visually within tables. You know, whatever we want, we want to create this document. We want to give it to somebody. You know, we want to send it to a user to be able to utilize. Now we can create PDFs directly from. Um, the software. One of the things that I'm, I've done in this particular PDF is I've selected this picture and I'm going to export this PDF as a three-dimensional image, a 3D PDF, um, directly in when I create the PDF. 
So if I go here, I can just go ahead and choose export, and then I would choose export to PDF. We could choose a resolution, how many pages we want to do, if we want to split into multiple PDFs, so on and so forth. But when I'm done, I can go ahead and open up the PDF in a software like Bluebeam or Adobe Reader. And so in this case, because I created this as a 3D PDF image, I have full 3D PDF capabilities. So I can I can scroll around, I can zoom in, I can you know rotate around I can change my views you know so I could set a you know an X view or a, a Y view I can change the colors you know in this case I've set it to everything to be the, a, a one color you know so we can look at everything that we're doing here I can change and use you know uh, different wireframes or clip clipping boxes so all this is just all of this is just a um, it's just a, a you know the, the default uh, usefulness or the default functionality within um, the the 3D PDF technology. And so we can see here, you know, this is just the PDF that we created. So all this information, the same as it was created in the model, um, is right here in the in the document. Okay. Now the last part that I hadn't really, we didn't spend a whole lot of time yet talking about, um, and we can at, at a later date and time, um, if you guys, if someone is specifically interested in interoperability, C has a lot of different options for interoperability. Um, we have a direct link with Tecla, so it's mainly obviously used for steel detailing, um, some concrete detailing, but we have a direct link that sends analysis model information one-to-one -one from C to Tecla. We also have um, really robust interoperability with SDS2, another steel detailing package, um, through the IFC file exchange. Um, some people ask about Revit. We have some really great interop. We have a, a direct link with Revit, also support with Revit with IFC, and then really through IFC, uh, we can support really any uh, any BIM offering tool that supports IFC. Now, before I finish, uh, I wanted to just um, kind of finish on some kind of user projects. That's one of the questions that we get the most after we talk to people about the software is that, hey, what are your users doing? You know, what, what kind of projects, what kind of things are they creating? So every two years we actually release, uh, we actually print out a really nice coffee table book and we call it, um, you know, this year's was the Art of Structural Design. And it's really just a user contest that our users can submit their, their exciting projects. So I just pulled out a few um, different projects. In this case, this first one is just kind of a grain silo. Um, so we have not only the silo itself, um, and the foundation elements, but also kind of the catwalk and the and the supporting roof structure. So all of those elements were modeled, designed, um, loaded, documented in, in C Engineer. Um, here's a really interesting structure, just a, a steel supporting structure for this boiler. But the really great thing about this was it's also incorporated IFC. And so you can see here that this kind of mechanical system, this boiler, um, which you're not going to model. You don't have. You're not creating that particular. You're not analyzing that particular part of the model. But you want to really be able to understand how your structure needs to work around that particular boiler to be able to support it. And so, using that IFC information, you could really see in three dimensions how you have to build your model. So. support this structure. You know, parts of a uh, have to be in pieces. And so in this case, we have a few different um, kind of sets of lifting equipment um, that were modeled using more plate-like structures in C Engineer loaded and then understanding the stresses or the 3D stresses and, and, and information within these, far, in these uh, particular um, sets of lifting equipment. And so really it just runs the gamut of different things that you would need to do in industrial applications. Now the final thing I wanted to just mention is um, we talked a little bit about design forms. We actually have two free sets of design forms that exist um, uh, at these two web pages. Um, they're actually external design forms. Obviously, for you users that don't have SIA, you could utilize these externally just like you would any Excel sheet or um, you know external application like TEDS or anything. So we have a an AISC base plate check that's a standalone check for base plates. We also have a set of HSS design tools that we created with the uh, Steel Tube Institute. Um, so um, three different moment connections for HSS columns to beams, um, shear connections, just a simple uh, curved and straight beam and, and column checks as well as a, a base plate check. And so those are available at those two websites. If, if you miss the websites, um, we can send them out um, uh, if, you, if, you, you know, if that's something that you desire, but those are the websites that you can send those to. And with that, I, I think that uh, we'd like to open the, the time up to, to questions. So I, I thank you for participating. I thank you for um, your time. And uh, at this point, I'll, I'll answer any questions that we can. Perfect. Thank you, Ben. Well, we've got one for you. You covered um, the interoperability with BIM software. 
Uh, is there any interoperability with CAD packages such as SolidWorks, Solid Edge, Inventor, or PTC? Sure. So um, the answer to that question is yes. So the main way to exchange data, um, for us at least, to exchange data directly with those packages would be through um, either IFC or more uh, vector-based image file formats like 3D DXFs, 3D DWGs, uh, 3D VRML files, or even I know some of what I've done in the past with a software like SolidWorks is actually being able to exchange data via XML. So exporting data, everything in SIA can be exported via XML. So I can export data out of XML and I can actually import that text file either via XML or, or via some other method into um, some of those other programs. So those would be the ways that we would create that those interoperability workflows. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how does SIA handle more complex geometries like curved shell elements? Sure. Um, so, like I maybe mentioned briefly before, within the structure service itself, you know, there's actually some, obviously within the member tool, there's, there's the ability to model just curved 1D members, but there's also then the ability to model more, you know, complex like shell-based elements. So in this case, there's either just a, a shell modeling tool itself, so just you know, point and click you know, three or four um, endpoints on a shell to create a, a three-dimensional shell. There's also some quick tools where you could create a, um, you know, a surface of revolution, kind of like a cup, if you will, or a, uh, a swept surface where you can choose a, a, a surface and then kind of extrude that surface. So different complex modeling um, tools exist like that in SIA. We also have some predefined um, some predefined shapes. So if you look at the predefined shapes, we can actually automatically create these particular shapes, you know, just from a kind of a predefined generator, if you will, such that you don't have to create it on your own. All right. Thank you. Um, does this software have capabilities for flexible and rigid diaphragms? Uh, so yes. Um, so we do that in a couple different ways. Everything actually in SIA is um, is kind of uses the full semi-rigid nature of material um, because we all know that there aren't there in in real life there aren't pure flexible diaphragms there aren't pure rigid diaphragms um, we do one-way diaphragms um, within uh, using our our different decks and uh, different you know plywoods and stuff like that so you can actually physically choose a a, a composite deck or a roof deck or a, a form deck or a plywood and then it would act in a pure one-way fashion. Um, as far as rigid diaphragms, really, the, we don't have a pure rigid diaphragm. We could simulate one using rigid links and rigid arms like we have. But really, the way that we talk about rigidity as far as diaphragms is concerned is as rigid as the material you're using, the thickness of material. So if you have a 12-inch concrete slab that's connected at every column and, you know, has, um, you know, it has, that slab is going to have a, a fair amount of rigidity in that case. And so that's, that's how we use more of, um, that's, that's kind of where we fall on the, on the rigidity uh, scale for the, for the diaphragms. Perfect. All right, next question. Um, can desired buckling parameters be set for a group of members? Yeah, so within those, within those buckling parameters that we talked a little bit about earlier, um, you know, whenever we determine that we want to use a certain set of buckling parameters, maybe we decided that for, you know, our group of columns or a group of beams or something like that, we could then, that, that buckling set of parameters is automatically saved and then within the, within the properties of any given member, you can automatically just go ahead and choose that set of buckling uh, parameters. So I can just go ahead and choose not, I don't want to use the default, but I want to use BC1 or, or BC2 or whatever you've saved that set of buckling parameters as. Perfect. Thank you. Um, could, does this software generate uh, DXF detailing for concrete designs? So, yes, it, it does. So it, you can actually create a Based on with the detailing that we put in, um, that we saw a little bit earlier in that in that short video, um, you can actually at any given time in in the model, I can actually just right click and oops, I can actually right click in the model and save a picture, but it, the picture can actually be a DXF DWG or 3 3D DWG. So you can actually export a, a a DXF or DWG image at at any point for any view of the model. Now there are some 
uh, there, there is a kind of a wizard to automatically do uh, detailing or the reinforcement that you would add for, say, a beam or a column. Um, that's not available quite yet for 2D members, but it is available for 1D members. Um, but uh, really, for 2D members, you know, the easiest way to do it would just be through taking a taking a, a Z view of the model and then using that export to to DWG or DXF. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we've got another question about the diaphragms. Um, do they have fixed and pinned end connections? Yeah. So any any member, any any 1D member or 2D member within the and here I'll expand it here. We have what's called model data can have either a hinge, so hinge on beam or hinge on 2D member edge. So everything in SIA by default is considered to be is considered to be fixed. And so if you want to release the model in at either at the at the edge of a beam or at the edge of a slab or um, you want to hinge a beam to a slab in, in a certain way, you would then add a hinge. And so you have full six degrees of freedom, three rotation, three um, three translation um, for both hinges on the 2D member edges or hinges on a particular beam. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. Is it possible to apply modification factors for cracked section properties in concrete? Certainly, yeah. The first is those are automatically included within the um, design uh, the, the design checks of concrete, but when you want to include them within the analysis, we have something uh, that we call property modifiers. So for property modifiers, you can actually reduce the stiff, just the axial stiffness, the bending stiffness, or certain moments of inertia for one-dimensional or 2D members, specifically for concrete in that case, but you could do it for any member, um, just by simply adding, um, just by simply adding those property modifiers. All right, thank you. Um, when you're loading steel floors with area loads, the horizontal bracing is affected by this load. Is there any tool to avoid this? So the question being that we don't want a certain load to go onto certain bracing. Um, I mean, the way to avoid that in C Engineer would be we could, it would be really in the way that we connect um, really in the way that we connect the model. Now, we could do it one of two ways. Either we could do it in such a fashion that we connect the model, or whenever we look at the results or even the design of a specific brace, you know, in that case, probably what I would do is I would still connect everything like it's going to be connected. I would still load everything as it's going to be loaded. You could certainly create the brace such that it's only taking axial load or something like that. But really, when you go into the mo when you go into do the design of a particular brace or something like that, you can then choose that you want to use a certain design set of design combinations. And within that design combination, you could just omit that surface load, right? If that surface load is in a particular load case, you could just omit that that load case has any bearing on the design of that particular uh, element. So in that case, I would create probably the easiest would be to create a separate combination for, you know, ASD braced combinations or something like that that would omit the you know the the loading on the floors and the walkways. All right, thank you. Uh, when you're creating build up members, will the software design details like weld joints? It won't do the weld it so it won't design the details of the weld joints. So, you know, if you're going to create that build up member like we created previously, it's not going to say okay, between these in order to in order to make this stiffness or to make this a cohesive element that you need a three sixteenths inch fillet weld or or, or or circle or a pe full penetration weld or something like that. It will not, it won't design that. Now you can understand the stresses because of what C is doing, you can understand the stresses in those particular fibers to then design the weld, but it's not going to design the weld for you. All right, thank you. Is it possible to create, say, your own external check using design form? Oh, certainly. Yeah, so I mean that that would certainly be one of the one of the options and I know we've talked about that with some of our other users in doing stuff like that. If you're really needing to create those custom cross sections and want to understand the check of those cross sections, you know, being able to extract that piece of information, that stress or um, those different stresses in that fiber, and that's what it is. That's that's that particular fiber. You know, if I open up the model here and we look at um, let's Oops, I'm in the wrong model. If we open up the model and we look at that particular cross-section that we created, we can see that, you know, 
there's a certain fiber that's there, you know, 26 or 25. So we could pull out the stress in that particular fiber and then, you know, use that stress as kind of the driving force to create and check our welds using a design form. Perfect. Thank you. Um, if you make changes to the CM model, is it possible to export these reconfigured models to your BIM program? Yeah, so with en with whether it's through Tecla or X, uh, uh, IFC or Revit, there's um, you know there's any any change that you make to that particular model, we could either just um, export you know directly to a Revit file or a Tecla file or you know a graphic you know uh, DXF DWG file or an IFC. Coming the other direction, you know if you made a, if you had a change that happened in um, in Revit or Tecla or, or something else, we could actually use what we call an update feature. And so the update would actually compare, it would do a model comparison of the model that you currently have in your CIA model and then comparing it with what the information that's coming in from either XML or Revit or Tecla or IFC. And then it would basically tell you where the changes were and it would allow you to accept or decline those particular changes. Great, thank you. Um, what are the capabilities of this software for design optimization? So for s design optimization, um, you have capabilities for all different types of steel, so composites, joists, um, um, and standard steel, you know, non-composite non steel um, for strength-based optimization. Um, the composite service includes uh, deflection-based serviceability-based optimization as well. Um, the uh, for concrete, um, concrete is more of uh, you know it's more of a, a design. So there's in that case there's not a there's not a full optimization or auto design tool for concrete. Um, you can do some optimization of um, uh, bent frames and uh, you know two dimensional frames. There's some drift opt optimization and stuff for two dimensional frames. Um, I think that's all the different optimization types. Um, and then obviously through design forms we can build any, you know, we've built a few different connection type optimizations and, um, and stuff like that, that, you know, any, any really type of des design optimization is poss possible using design forms as well. All right. Thank you. And what are the capabilities for light gauge design? Oh yeah, that's, I totally forgot about that. I apologize. So yeah, so we have a full suite of tools for the cold form design, light gauge design as well. Um, and so the optimization also, you can also do an optimization of the light gauge. In that case, it would be an optimization not specifically of out of like a profile library, say like the Dietrich library or the or the Unistrut library or something, but it would be an optimization of the parameters that go ahead go into defining. That, those particular types of members. And so if I look here at, at the thin wall geometric members very quickly, you know, if I pick a Z shape, it's defined by the height, the width, and that thickness. And so we could optimize, you know, the, the elements that we've added based on the height. You know, we can optimize those different uh, parametric criteria, those heights, those widths, and that thickness. And then verify them towards the AIS, for the AISI code. All right. Thank you, Ben. Well, I think that's just about all of the time we have for today. So thank you to Ben, and thanks to the audience for joining us. If you came in late, don't worry. We will have a recording of this webinar up shortly on engineering.com. Take care, and we'll see you soon.